This is the Monday, November 2nd, 2015 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. This is the History Author Show. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And I want to thank you for joining us on our IR Radio channel, iTunes, Spreaker, or one of the other places we're available. Today's guest is Jennifer Kinchelow. Her debut novel is The Secret Life of Anna Blanc. It hits shelves on November 3rd, 2015, the day after we're uploading this episode for your listening pleasure. You can follow Jennifer on Twitter and like the book's Facebook page at facebook.com slash the secret life of Anna Blanc. She also has a website, jenniferkinchelow.com. The last name is K-I-N-C-H-E-L-O-E. And if you like old pictures, definitely visit her Pinterest page. More on that in a minute. But first, let's go back to a time before websites and social media even existed and ask, just who is Anna Blanc and what's her secret? Well, Anna might be the girl next door if you live in 1907 and call a Los Angeles mansion home. Anna's a socialite whose French-born controlling father expects her to live a life of dance balls and charity work, reading nothing more risque than a few carefully selected pages of the society newspapers. In an age when a woman's options for work outside the home were already severely limited, Anna yearns for more. She wants a life of crime. Not to commit them, Jupiter, no. Anna Blanc wants to solve crimes, but apart from devouring the latest Sherlock Holmes novels behind her father's back, there's very little outlet for Anna's analytical mind in this age. That is, until she lies her way into a job at the LAPD, until she discovers a string of murdered prostitutes, until her father's bank fails and he's forced to allow her to get engaged. Ah yes, until. That's where a great story always begins. Welcome to The Secret Life of Anna Blanc with Jennifer Kinchelow. I'm on the line with Jennifer Kinchelow, author of The Secret Life of Anna Blanc. Thank you for making the time to talk with the History Author Show, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. I want to start off, before we get into the plot of the book, describing your journey to publication, because I think it'll be really inspiring and encouraging to a lot of the people out there who think they have a novel in them and want to write one. Because like myself, you're trained as a scientist, not an author. You do analytics and numbers, that kind of thing. Your day job is at a consulting firm, and you were a policy researcher at UCLA. So explain to people how you got from the pipette and PhD I wrote, and I want to get that into the pen and paper. Because I think it's clever. (laughs) It is clever. (laughs) Um, Well, I never dreamed I would write books. And um, I, except for possibly some academic tome. But once I got sick, I got Epstein-Barr and I was in bed for two months. And I spent those months listening to books on tape. And when I got better, I was in between projects and I had a lot of time. And I decided I would play at writing. And you know, writing is a means of escape and you live vicariously through your characters and it's very exciting. It's like reading a good book, only more so. And I discovered that I loved it. I really enjoyed research science, but I loved writing. So I was writing all the time and I wrote three screenplays, which taught me storytelling. They were pretty awful, but one of them turned into The Secret Life of Anna Blanc. So it truly is my debut novel because it's the first fiction that I wrote. But I have to say being a research scientist is a lot easier than being an author. 
<laughs> yeah, because you have to stick to the facts. Who was it that said the fiction is much harder because you don't you have to stick to the facts, whereas in real life, <laughs> science doesn't. It, it was somebody, Einstein, somebody like that, or oh. you know, somebody from way back. And it's really true because you things happen in real life that you would not possibly believe. But if you put them in a book, people say that couldn't possibly have happened. That's so, so true. Yeah. And it really is an amazing first effort. It would be a book that I think anybody would be proud to publish as their seventh or eighth novel, much less first. And it's Thank really you. a oh, you're welcome. It's really a story about a woman's journey to grow up. Also, it, this is a particularly rigid time, and she lives in a very rigid household with her widowed father. And it's not just a mystery in history. It's really a book that takes you on a bunch of different plot lines, which I really enjoyed. It wasn't just straightforward historical fiction or straightforward mystery or anything like that. Yeah, there's so much in that time period. There's so much going on with women. So the book really charts Anna's journey growing up, like you said, and becoming more in charge of her life. So, um, and there's a lot of parallels to her experience as a very sheltered, very controlled young socialite with an overbearing father. And some of the other women in the book who are working class, or there are also women who are prostitutes and just sort of exploring the reasons behind that and what's that. Your dust jacket describes the stakes of Anna Blanc's secret this way. If the police find out, she'll get fired. If her father finds out, he'll disown her. And if her fiancé finds out, he'll cancel the wedding and stop pouring money into her father's collapsing bank. The economic crisis, panics as they called them at the time, in 1907, plays a role in your book, certainly. But that wasn't the only reason that you chose to set this in 1907, was it? Well, I needed to set it prior to 1910 because in 1910, the Los Angeles Police Department got their first female officer. And at the time of the story in The Secret Life of Anna Blanc, there are no women officers yet. So before 1910, and then 1907 was a pretty huge year for the banking industry. And Anna's father was a banker. So I set it in 1907 because of the bank panic. And Wall Street fell off almost 50% from its peak. And there was a run on the banks all over the country. And many went under. When writing historical fiction, not only do you have to take into account real things happening like the economic panic, though, it's also a challenge to craft a character who's true to the time but that doesn't repel a modern reader's sensibilities. And you had to walk that line when drafting Anna Blanc, obviously. How did you do it? Because she's an innocent, naive character, and you don't want her to come across as the idiot in the attic. It would be so easy to say, well, why Why is she doing these things? Why? Why does she care if her fiancé leaves her? Today, a woman has many options when they're single, and it might be impossible to imagine just how important that was and really how tethered she is to her father and to trying to get married, to get away from him. It's maybe not something a reader would identify with. So how did you do that so that we didn't lose sympathy for Anna Blanc along the way? Well, Anna is very innocent, and she's also not that great at reading social clues. <laughs> but I think we all have our areas of idiocy, of weakness, our blind spots, and I think they're counterbalanced in Anna by her extreme intelligence. She's very good at solving crimes. She outperforms any of the men at Central Station. And readers tend to root for characters if they are very, very good at something. But I also think the book explains why Anna is the way she is. She's very much a product of her time and the way her domineering father raised her, which makes her more sympathetic. Um, and also, Anna's brand of innocence is easily dispelled, and it is dispelled in the course of the book. People tell me that she's even more likable towards the end as they learn about her journey and what she goes through to get where she ends up. And that's part of good fiction is watching a character take that journey or for you writing it to make sure that she does change and grow up and evolve and isn't the same person on the first page that she is the last, which she certainly is not. When I think of the social cues with Anna, it's certainly written very subtly. And I, I like that throughout this book. There was a lot of little things that you did. I hit on one thing late in the book and I sent you an email and I said, that's just so well done. You didn't mention it. You didn't telegraph it. You didn't point it out. It was just something very subtle that I bet 99 out of 100 readers might miss, but you didn't care about that. And I like that kind of writing, whether it's for TV or for novels, where it's okay if some people get some things and other people don't get other things. I'm sure there's plenty of things that I miss. 
Her world, by the way, is L.A., which is another thing. You talk a lot about the weather, which is something that doesn't change year to year. You talk about the Santa Ana winds. But it occurred to me when reading it, I don't know how much of her L.A. is left because you have earthquakes and things like that and development. So how much of her Los Angeles really was still there for you to visit when you're building this book? I was able to uncover a bunch of wonderful, wonderful photographs of Los Angeles during the period. But the actual buildings, very, very little is left. And I think part of that is just L.A. culture. From the beginning, we've we've really emphasized progress and being modern in the, in the earliest, earlier part of the 20th century. And L.A. prided themselves and marketed themselves as having new technologies before some of the older, bigger cities in the East. And they were the first city to have electric lights. They had the best streetcars and telephone system in the nation. But the downside of this is that they didn't value their history as much. So many of the beautiful buildings that are in the secret life of Anna Blanc were torn down in the name of progress. So yes, some of it was because of earthquake damage. There was a big earthquake in Long Beach in 1933. And some of it came down when they were blasting to put the freeways in. Mm. But a lot of it was just mowed down in the 50s. I mean, Central Station, which is where much of the secret life of Anna Block takes place, was perfectly sound, and they tore it down in 1955. And they mowed down the beautiful houses on Bunker Hill, where Anna's mansion was, because the neighborhood had become a slum. So instead of restoring them, they just cleared them out. It's like the old Penn Station in New York that people always sort of go to is kicking off the drive to preserve things in New York City because here was this beautiful building and they knock it down and they replace it with just, I don't know what you even call Madison Square Garden. I think I called it a cake tray one time. One of those <laughs> in the 50s, you know, it's that big round. They just renovated it inside. But compared to the old classic style of Penn Station that the Pennsylvania Railroad built, it was just so beautiful and so classic in its architecture that it would have endured forever. And they knocked it down. And it's really a tough thing when you read a book like this. You say, gosh, I'd like to go visit that spot. And then you look it up and you see that it's not been preserved and it's by human beings. Not At least when an earthquake, you can say, well, there's nothing that you could do. But when we don't preserve our history, that makes it tough. And in that case, the only way that you really can go back to L.A. of 1907 is to read a book like The Secret Life of Anna Blanc or read historical fiction because you linger on some of these things just enough to really set the sight. And that was one thing also that you did with the weather because you can still feel the weather. And that drives the book too, doesn't it? Yeah. I I mean, I use the east winds sort of as a metaphor. In, In California, we have the east winds or the Santa Ana winds, which are hot and dry My mother worked at a hospital, and she used to say that the emergency room would always go crazy when the east winds were blowing because people would be agitated. They'd be more aggressive. They took more risks. So I kind of use that comparing Anna to the east winds and also using the east winds as an excuse or an influence on her sort of risky decisions. Can I read some? Sure, go ahead. Um, The Santa Ana winds came up, blowing hard from the east, licking up the last drops of moisture and charging the air with electricity. The hot winds infused the city with a restlessness that could not be sated. Horses bolted, teenage girls ran away from home, and ordinarily peaceful men started bar fights or struck their wives. Anna loved the winds, which came every year, though they made her hair wild. They mirrored her insides. So, yeah, I, I use the weather a lot. <laughs> yeah, and not, and I'm saying things like you linger on the architecture or you use the weather a lot, but none of that comes across in this novel as too much. It's It's just enough, I feel, when I read it. And it's not a long book, so it's not as if you have 30 pages just of exposition and you're showing off your research. And I bet that would have been easy for you to do because you are a person that's dedicated in your real job, quote unquote, to facts and making sure everything's detailed and footnoted. But this is a fast read, and I never felt like it was too long. I never felt like skipping anything. And that's really a credit to you and how you built it. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, I I get, sometimes I find over description, too much description in in history, historical fiction, a little tedious. So I was very aware of that when I wrote it. 
We're speaking with author Jennifer Kinchelow about her debut novel, The Secret Life of Anna Blanc. Please do follow Jennifer on Twitter and like Anna's page at facebook.com slash The Secret Life of Anna Blanc. First-time authors need our support, and I want to point out that you got some great support from a lot of authors there online. You've had some good reviews of the book, and that has to make you feel good. So congratulations on that, too. Thank you. Yeah, I Booklist gave me a starred review, and I just got a review from RT Reviews, and they gave me four stars. So it was really thrilling, and it makes some of the hard parts of being a writer worthwhile when you get those kudos. Now, Back in 1907, as far as the options a woman would have had in police work, never mind something like a research scientist at UCLA, there really wasn't a lot for you to go on there. But you mentioned one gem that you found, which is Mary A. Jenks's 10 Years in the Life of a Police Matron. How much of her experience would you say mirrors what Anna goes through in the book? Well, I think that Mary's autobiography is sort of a sanitized version of what's really going on in police stations. And that's true of a lot of things that were written in the period. There's some things that just weren't acceptable to say. But it does outline her duties, and that was very helpful to me, the kinds of work that the matrons did. But it was also very much a propaganda piece for the temperance movement. And one of the things that I learned from Mary is how important the temperance movement was in getting police matrons into the jails and police stations because the temperance workers would go in to interact with the women who were drunk. And they saw so much of the crime and the domestic violence, child abuse was influenced by alcohol. But Anna herself is different from Mary Jenks. She's not a temperance person. She likes her whiskey. And you were mentioning also pictures. You see a lot of these people and a lot of these, I guess you would say, lost souls sort of at the time. And they went through a lot of painful things. And you really see it on the faces of the people. And when you started talking to me about the pictures, you told me about your Pinterest page, which was a real jaw-dropping thing to me. Tell the listeners what you have on your Pinterest page. Yeah, I researched the book with a lot of original sources. And one of the things that I looked at were photographs so that I could see what people were like, how they behaved in different situations, you know, when they were silly and what they wore, what the buildings looked like. And so I collected electronic pictures from many different sources, and I have something like 30,000 of them now <laughs> on my Pinterest page. Yeah, so, um, and I have different sort of boards. I have one on fashion and shoes and candid pictures and portraits and just life. So it's kind of a destination place, my Pinterest page, honestly. It's pretty informative, and a lot of it's funny. You know, they're goofing off, and it's, it's great. Yeah, there's things like that that you don't see because people always pose for pictures. Photography is relatively new, and there's a lot of long shutter times where you have to stand there. And when I look at the same era, a little before that, of New York City pictures, it's mostly the children that will make faces. There's one famous Jacob Reese picture, and many of those were posed partially because of the limitations of the equipment. But you can just see the kids laying there on the grate. There's three of them. It's one of the covers of How the Other Half Lives. And I'll, I'll post it at historyauthor.com and at our Facebook page. But you see the kids laughing. And not that they didn't have horrible lives, not that they weren't sleeping in the street, but they're still children. And there's another one that I will also post, a paper boy and a little paper girl. And he's standing there kind of very straight. And she's next to him and she has a hand on her hip and she's cocking her head and winking at the cameraman. And Oh, how cute. Yeah, it's, it's one of my favorite pictures of all time because here they were just in this little second of their life and in a way that adults weren't. They just didn't have that. And I personally am not a big smiler in pictures. People tell me that all the time. When I, I went with my friend Brian Ireland, and this was in 1997, he said, you're ruining my pictures because you're not smiling. You never <laughs> look happy. And I said, I don't think Greek people smile. And then I started looking <laughs> at all my uh, my family photos. And you know, there's my wife on one side with her family, Irish Canadian, they're all smiling big. And there's me and my parents and my family on the other side. And everybody's just looking serious. And <laughs> on the inside, you might think you're smiling, Dean, but you're not. So <laughs> this is really something when you go to your Pinterest page, you can lose hours there. And also when you like your Facebook page, I notice often, there it is, the Secret Life of Anna Blanc Facebook page, 
things will pop up. You post some of these pictures and that's really a great way to set the stage there. And you don't need to then add all of that exposition in the book because if people read it and love it, they can see it. They can get a little help visualizing it. So I really like that about social media and things like Pinterest because here it is 2015. We at least have an option. You don't have to just describe. So thank you for setting that up. That's great to share your research like that. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, there's a whole board which just buildings and things that are actually in the book. So you can look and see what Central Station really looked like and what the orphan asylum looked like. Yeah. And you mentioned clothes. Now, they played a major part in a woman's life. Suits are suits kind of for men. But for women, there was a lot of things that you had to do. There were a lot of layers, so to speak, of clothes. There was no casual Fridays. You went out, you were dressed, you made sure you you weren't going to go out in shorts, certainly in a t-shirt and no hat or anything. And so I wanted to ask, how did you decide so many things about how to dress her? What did you do other than just looking at pictures to make sure you dress them not only properly, but you avoid anachronisms like zippers and that kind of thing? I had to research that heavily because I really started from zero. I didn't know what clothes looked like in 1907, but I turned to the newspaper and the fashion pages of the Los Angeles Herald were just wonderful. There were full of instructions on what to wear, when, what occasions. It had pictures, you know, this is an afternoon gown, this is a visiting gown, this is a dinner gown, this one's for tennis. <laughs> you know, what's out of style? What are the latest trends in LA? What are the latest trends in Paris? So there was that, but I also read novels that were written in the period and noted how the clothing was described, what were people wearing in different situations, and also what the slang was for different pieces of clothing. Yeah, you definitely need that because, again, so many levels and so many ways the book works. And for me, who loves the period in particular, I'm always wondering when I go into it, oh, gosh, is anything going to jump out at me that, well, that's an anachronism or that's something they didn't say. And I'd mentioned to you off the air that I was so thankful that your book was so good because we'd been talking about having you on the show before I opened the book. And I said, <laughs> gosh, if I open this book and it's not really, really good. How am I going to tell this nice lady that I don't want to have her on because, you know, it's only her first try and maybe it won't be so good. And, you know, maybe I started talking a little bit out of school, so to speak. And then I read it. I don't want to gush over things too much because people think I'm insincere, but that was really something that you captured. There wasn't one anachronism that I found. And as I said, I spend most of my time living back then in my opinion. So that was really great. Uh, another thing that you do is naming the characters. I wanted to touch on that briefly. You really effectively use the names. And again, in a subtle way, the leering policeman is named Wolf. And his controlling father consents to her dating a man finally. And he's named Mr. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. You didn't do this too much, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about how you do the naming, like even Anna, Blanc, White, Innocence, and all that goes with that color. So how did you work on naming the characters in your book? You had a great answer for this. Well, I think the characters name themselves. And I get away with using these symbolic names because the tone of the book is a little bit farcical. Despite the seriousness of some of the themes, most notably the oppression of women, it doesn't take itself too seriously. But I did have to change the name of some of the characters because they were too close to the historical figures' names. And my copy editor said, ah, oh, this might be confusing. Rethink this. And it was painful to give them a new name. So, for example, Matron Clemens used to be called Matron Stebbins because she was modeled after Alice Stebbins Wells. So, yeah, the characters kind of name themselves. And also there's – this is a murder mystery – so it, there's a lot of that stuff that happens in there, too. So not just what the oppression is, but this is really chasing down killers and killers of people that even today, I guess something we could relate to is we'd call them marginalized people, prostitutes or sex crimes. that, As you said, they just didn't want to put in the paper. So they would sort of cover them over with euphemisms and with no women on the police force. These would have been even harder to really see from that perspective. You're losing one half of the human population's insight, I guess you could say. And this gives Anna a real opportunity to use this incredible analytical mind that you put inside her skull because she sees things from a whole different perspective than a male policeman would. And 
vice versa. You also sort of balance that out and you have them sort of dispelling some of these things because as much as she's read books, she has a lot of book smarts from sneaking away from her father and reading these Sherlock Holmes novels and other things like that. But the real world experience needs to be combined. And that's also a story in the book is just how these two sides or two sexes merge together to try to catch some of these really horrible people that are stalking L.A. in 1907. Yeah, that's right. Okay, we have spent enough time in the present, and I am hankering to get back to the turn of the 20th century and go maybe spend a few minutes on your Pinterest page. So (laughs) I know you feel the same way. So let me ask you one final question. Will there be another adventure in store for Anna Blanc? Oh, definitely. I've already sort of written the second novel. I'm just revising it. But it's set in Los Angeles' Chinatown in 1908. Again, Anna is the protagonist. And it was inspired by historical events that I read about in the paper. So in 1908, the president of one of the largest Chinese gangs, they call themselves Tongs, he had two beautiful sing-song girls that he was very proud of. And they were basically sex slaves. And the leader of a rival Tong stole these girls and took them to Los Angeles. So the Tong president, the original owner, offered a $1,000 reward for the return of the girls. And the LAPD decided to hunt the girls and return them to their owners so they could collect the reward and also avert a Tong war. And I just thought it was so shocking that I had to write about it. So that's (laughs) sort of what's inspiring book two. I'm going to very much look forward to it. Thank you so much for sharing it with the History Author Show today. I really hope everybody listening knows that I am sincere when I say how much I enjoyed it. It's a wonderful novel. Pick it up. And thank you again, Jennifer, for joining me today. Thank you, Dean. I hope you enjoyed listening to our historical fiction author, Jennifer Kinchelow. Her debut novel, The Secret Life of Anna Blanc, hits shelves on November 3rd, 2015. You can follow Jennifer on Twitter and like Anna's page at facebook.com slash the secret life of Anna Blanc. And again, you're going to see some great pictures when you toss her a like. The website again is jenniferkinchelow.com, K-I-N-C-H-E-L-O-E. And don't forget about that Pinterest page. 30,000 images to get your fill of old Los Angeles. If you enjoy historical fiction, I hope you'll consider picking up The Secret Life of Anna Blanc by clicking through the banner at historyauthor.com. We get a six-pence coin every time you do. And if you don't get that reference, well, you'll just have to read the book. It is a mystery, after all. Let us know what you think of The Secret Life of Anna Blanc and the interview at History Dean on Twitter or at facebook.com slash historyauthor. Thank you for listening and for favoriting our iHeartRadio channel or subscribing to The History Author Show on iTunes and leaving us a review. I can't stress just how much it means to everyone here when we get some feedback from you, good or bad. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us next week for another trip into the past. Until then, thanks for listening, and happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. 